tonight, tonight we are going to be talking about the, the discipline of evangelism. Evangelism. Um, there is nothing, nothing, nothing that compares to you spreading the gospel, sharing the gospel with someone, and that person responding and receiving Jesus. I'm telling you, there ain't a drug on the market that matches that kind of high. It'll, it'll fill you up. I'm telling you, uh, it, it is something you can't compare uh, when you have that opportunity to the Lord. And so what we're going to do tonight, we're going to focus in on the very uh, subject of evangelism. I, I, would, I, would, I would believe there's plenty of people who would say, you know what, I have a consistent Bible reading time. I have a consistent prayer time, but I, I would believe there's, there's a very, very rare people that you would say, you know what, I'm very consistent in sharing my faith. I think we can all improve in that area, I, if, you, if, you, you know, if you agree with me. So tonight we're going to focus in on that. So if you would, let's pray, and then uh, we'll get started. My Father, we are so thankful to be here in your church. And so, God, I pray that you would just bless this service, Lord, that you would encourage us, and Lord, that you would uh, reveal new truths, maybe some exciting things, Lord, that you would, uh, Lord, just empower us to go out and share our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Y'all can be seated, y'all can be seated. Um, so when it comes to evangelism, sharing your faith, witnessing, obviously, you know, here at Temple, we have been very, very uh, hard on pushing that. We've been encouraging you to share your faith, to, to go tell people. We've been partnering with, with TTI, and we've been starting DMD, and disciples making disciples. So obviously, this is something you've heard a lot about here at Temple. Um, but why? I, I want your feedback. They're at Fairview, too. I want you to, I want you to shout it to me. What do you think the number, number one reason why people don't share their faith is? Fear. 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 Exactly. Fear. It's the fear. Um, you know, I, I think everyone in here would say it, it's fear. But what I've learned, what I've learned is this, that the more consistent you are at doing something, the less fearful it becomes. You know what I'm saying? Like, like remember the first time you went swimming? You thought you was going to drown, right? Uh, if, it, if you were coming up like me the old school way, they treated you like John Wayne and just threw you in, right? You know, you just sink or swim, and you fought for your life uh, trying to figure out how to swim. And then maybe the first time you ever jumped off a diving board, boy, you were scared to death. But the more times you do it, all of a sudden you're not as fearful. I think evangelism is very similar in that capacity where the more you do it, the less fearful you become. Now, I did not say you don't stay fearful. There's still, I still get fearful. I still, boy, it, it's still, my anxiety gets high when I'm, when I'm about to share with somebody, trying to psych myself up to share with somebody. But I'm convinced the more that we do it, the easier it becomes, right? And so that's why it needs to become a discipline, something we discipline ourselves to do. Um, I would bet everybody in here would say, yes, we need to share our faith. We believe we need to share our faith. When it comes to sharing your faith, when it, share, when it comes to sharing the gospel, here's how we need to be. The message... Jesus Christ, here, here's the gospel. Let me read you the gospel. This is Paul's perspective of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. This is what Paul says. All right, we're going to take it straight from the scripture. This is the gospel. So 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Verse 3 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, which I also received, how that Christ, here's the gospel, how Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Jesus died for your sins and he rose again on the third day. Right? That's the gospel. So our evangelism, we need to hold tight to the message. The message doesn't need, doesn't need to change. All right, we need to tell people Jesus loves you. Jesus died for your sins. Jesus has overcome the grave. He has brought victory. He has overcome your sin. He has brought forgiveness for you. The message needs to stay the same. We don't let loose the message. It's, it's secure. But our methods can vary. Our methods can vary. We don't all have to have, have, to have the same method. Like we can, we can be flexible in that capacity. But the message needs to stay the same. So why is evangelism important? I'm going to give you three things, and we're going to kind of go through these and explain them. But why is evangelism important? Number one, because it is expected. It's expected. I have in parentheses there, commanded. In Matthew 28, 19 through 20, 
Jesus is given the great commission. He says, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Look at Luke 24, 47. Luke 24, 47 says, And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Okay, there's another command that it should be preached among all nations. John 20, 21. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath what? Sent me, even so what? Send I you. In other words, we are sent, and so we have a mission, right? Acts 1, 8. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. So, so these are commands given to not just the apostles. These are commands given to you, believer. Right? You are commanded to go and share your faith, to go preach the good news everywhere you go. That is your command. That is something that is expected of you as a believer in Christ. The apostles are not the ones who came to Coleman, Alabama and spread the faith. All right? the, the apostles are not the ones who came to your neighborhood and spread the faith. No, it was individual believers. All right? it, it, is, it is people who have been called by God, saved and transferred from death to life that have gone and shared the good news. Down there at TSM, when I was always talking to teenagers, I would tell them, I'd say, hey, listen, I'm a 37-year-old man with two kids, married. It is awkward for me to walk up to a 13-year-old girl and be like, hey, you know Jesus? All right, they're going to be like, this is a creeper. All right, they're going to they're going to they're going to kind of feel awkward as this old man, this old chubby guy comes and talks to him about Jesus. But I said, you know what's not awkward for another 13-year-old girl to go talk to that 13-year-old girl. And so I'd always encourage him. I say, hey, the greatest missionary to your generation is you. That's the greatest missionary there is. Hey, listen, the greatest missionary to your workplace is you. The greatest missionary to your family is you. The greatest missionary to your friends is you. All right, so we are called to be missionaries to the people that we are connected to, our network of friends, our circle of influence. And, and some people think, well, I just don't have that gift. I don't, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I'm just, I've had people tell me that. I just don't have that gift. I'm just so shy. I don't have that gift. Now, now sometimes I take Ephesians chapter 4, 11 out of context. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you that verse. I want you to see what it says. Paul is speaking about the giftings that people have been equipped with within the church. And so in Ephesians 4, 11, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists. See that word evangelist? And some pastors and teachers, and so they say, hey, I'm not an evangelist. That's not my gifting. And so, yes, while it is true that God has gifted some people for the ministry of evangelists, he calls all believers to be witnesses. All right. So, so, and he provides them with the power to do so. So, so yes, uh, all, all evangelists are called to be witnesses, but only some witnesses are called to be evangelists. So we're all commanded to be witnesses. All right, it is not just a specific gift for a specific person. It's, it's not just the pastor's responsibility. It's not just the staff responsibility. It is your responsibility. So it is expected of you. But I, I, want, I want to help us understand the gravity of this. I, I want us to look at Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. For me, this is the outline of how the gospel spreads. All right, this is how, this is how it's set up. Romans 10, 13 through 15. Starting in verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, I, I want you, I had kind of a, a slide that I want you all to kind of look at because I want to, I want to deconstruct these verses and I want you to, and we're going to work from the bottom up. We're going to start in verse 15, working backwards. So, so in verse 15, it talks about how God is sending people to preach. Now don't, now, don't get it twisted, all right? When he says preach, it means to be a proclaimer of the good news. Everybody in here is a proclaimer of the good news. It, it doesn't mean you're a pastor or a preacher. It just means you are spreading the good news. So, so do you believe that God is still st sending people to preach? All right, you believe that. All right, go to verse 14. 
In verse 14, it says that when people preach, unbelievers will hear. Do you believe when people preach, there's an opportunity for unbelievers to hear? Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so then, still in verse 14, when unbelievers hear, it says they can believe. So do you believe that? When an unbeliever hears, they have the opportunity to believe. Okay. Now, still in verse 14, do you believe when unbelievers believe that now they can call on the Lord? When they, ha when they finally put their belief in it, now they can call on the Lord. Do you believe that? Yeah. All right, now we get to verse 13. It says, when an unbeliever calls on the Lord, they will be saved. Yeah. Do you all believe that? Yeah. Agree. Okay, so there is a potential breakdown in this whole thing. There is a weak link. So we know that God is sending people to preach. We know that when people preach, the gospel is heard. When people hear it, they can believe. When they believe, they can call on the name of the Lord. When they call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. We believe that. Here's the only flaw in that whole plan. God is sending, but are you going? God is sending, but are you preaching? Because, because here's, here, here's where it all falls apart. If you are not preaching, then that means people are not hearing. And if they are not hearing, that means they're not believing. And if they're not believing, that means they're not calling on the name of the Lord. And if they're not calling on the name of the Lord, that means they're not being saved. The whole potential breakdown of all of this is us. If we don't do what we're called to do, because God is still sending us, but if we're not doing what he's called us to do, then it all falls apart. Do you see how big of a deal this is? Like this is the plan. There is no plan B, by the way. There, there is, you are plan A. And if you're not doing it, then it falls apart. So it is absolutely expected of us to tell the good news. Secondly, secondly, why is evangelism so important? Well, it is empowered. It is empowered. Here's what I love. I think I have in your handout what God expects he empowers. What God expects, he empowers. He's expecting you to go share the gospel, but he's going to give you the power to do it as well. We, we have to get out of this mindset. We have to get out of the mindset that it's, we need some kind of specialized training to witness effectively. Like we have to, we, we have to, uh, we have this excuse that we say, you know, when I feel better prepared, when I feel like I can answer all the questions, when I feel like I've done all the training, when that day comes, I will start sharing my faith. Now, here's the problem in that. That day will never come. You will never feel ready. I promise you. You will never feel ready. You will never feel like you're prepared. You'll never feel like you have all the answers to all the questions. If you're waiting for that day to happen, hang it up. Because that day is never coming. And, and, and so we need to adopt a motto. You know what a motto is? A saying. All right, we need to adopt a, a saying. Pastor Malcolm has used this saying before, and we're going to reintroduce it. All right, here is the motto you need to embrace. We need to say, embrace the awkward. Because let's just, let's just admit it, it's going to be awkward. It's going to be awkward. So everybody, I want you to repeat, embrace the awkward. Ready? Out there at Fairview, here we go. Ready? Embrace just embrace the awkward. Let's just call it like it is. It's awkward to share your faith. It's awkward to engage strangers. It's awkward to start a gospel conversation. It's awkward. And it ain't going to always be that way, but most of the time it will. All right, it's going to be awkward most of the time. On very rare cases, will you ever have a conversation that leads into the gospel where it doesn't feel awkward? Sometimes it just flows smoothly. And you're like, ooh, this is, I like this. Sometimes it's low-hanging fruit. Like God just has already got them ready. And all you got to do is say, do you know Jesus? And you're like, oh, I just want to know him so bad. And you're like, well, that was easy. And if you have one like that, it's going to sabotage you because you're going to think they're all like that, and they ain't. But most of the time, it's going to be a little awkward. And so we need to embrace the awkward. Most intentional gospel conversations, when you're approaching someone and you're forcing yourself to speak about the gospel, it's going to feel a little awkward. And, and, and we just have to embrace it. And here's another reason why I think we're so fearful. I think we feel so fearful and unprepared because of the seriousness of the topic. You know what I'm saying? Like, like heaven and hell is at stake. And what if I say the wrong thing? Like, what, what if I'm a stumbling block? What if my nerves shine through and they don't take me serious? Like, man, 
I don't, I don't want to be the reason why someone doesn't know Jesus. And so because of the seriousness of the topic, we kind of become hesitant of even engaging in those kind of conversations because we feel like we're going to mess it up. Yeah. Y- 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 y'all know what I'm saying? Sometimes we feel the weight of that. And, and, and if, we, if we believe that the results of that conversation are totally on us, then we are wrong. If you believe that it's all up to you on whether or not that person comes to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if that's what you believe, you're wrong. It's not up to you. There's no excuse on, hey, I don't feel prepared or I don't feel good enough. Because because here's the thing. The results are up to God. So so what what does successful evangelism look like? I think I have a blank there on your paper. What does successful evangelism look like? successful evangelism, listen, sharing the gospel is successful evangelism. That is it. Successful event is sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel, period, is successful evangelism. That's what, that's what the gospel is. So, so here's what we need to do. We have an obsession with sharing the gospel. And whether or not people get saved, that's up to God. As long as we're sharing the gospel, as long as we're going out there sharing our testimony with people, that's success. Here's, here's how we need to picture evangelism. You're the postal service. You're the postal service. Your, your job is to deliver the message. It is not your responsibility on how they receive that message. All right, you are the person delivering the message, and their response is between them and God. All right, uh, listen. <laughs> Not every time you share is it going to be a success. I know Pastor Malcolm can get up here, all these other soul winners can get up here, and they can share all these testimonies of all these people they won to the Lord. That's not how it always is. I remember when I was in youth group, I went door-to-door witnessing with my youth pastor, and he was showing me how it was done. And he would go knock on the doors, and he would tell them who he was and where, what church they were from and if they had time to talk and and we did about four or five doors, and I was driving. We'd drive from house to house to house. And after about four or five doors, we drove up to another house, and he said, your turn. And I almost threw up. I, got so, I was like, oh, no. I got so nervous. And I remember, listen, this is my first time ever willing to share the gospel. I pulled in this guy's driveway, and there's a bunch of cars, and I didn't want to block anybody in. So I kind of pulled off the side of his, off the side of his driveway. And he's in the front yard, and he's waving at me like this. And, and I hear him hollering. So I roll down my window. And he says, what are you doing? He said, you ran over my sprinkler. I said, oh, no. So I backed up, and water shot about 10 foot up in the air. And I, I was just, he's like, and he started cussing. He was not happy. And he says, who are you? I said, my name is Andrew. <laughs> from Galilean Baptist Church and we talked about Jesus he said get out I said yes sir and I backed up and I left that was my first experience sharing the gospel that'll scar somebody that'll make you not want to ever do it again listen there there was a time here recently here recently I had a young girl in my heart that I, I just felt like I needed to share the gospel with and usually when God puts somebody in your heart like that I feel like it's going to be like a success like, God's already stirring in my heart about this person. Like, this is going to be a good one. And I, I, I went up to her. This was at a restaurant. And uh, I, I, I saw her one day. It was just me and her in there. And I started talking to her. And I, I knew her parents. I knew her parents were very involved in church and everything else. And I started talking with her. And I said, hey, um, you get to go to church with your parents? And she says, no. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, tell me about your relationship with the Lord. Do you, you grew up in church. Do you have a relationship with the Lord? And listen, she went to doll cussing me, and she went to tell me everything she didn't like about the Bible. She went to tell me about how she didn't like that it, it spoke this way about homosexuals and this way about in the Old Testament, how if God was angry at one person, he would kill a whole nation and how this and this and this. And, and she didn't like this. And the whole time she's talking, I'm, I'm just trying to tell my face, straighten up. <laughs> and I'm praying, I'm praying hard. I said, God, please give me the words. Please give me the words because I didn't know what I was going to say next. And so she got finished talking, and I said, listen, I don't understand all the Bible either. I'll be honest. There's some things that are mysteries to me. I said, but I just want you to know that God loves you. 
he paid a price for you, and he wants nothing more than to have a relationship with you. And I said, so when you're ready, let's talk. And I just left it at that. Listen, there's sometimes you're going to have some awkward conversations that don't end the way you want them to end. But that's okay, because if you're sharing the gospel, it was successful. All right. So, so God empowers. First of all, he empowers. He empowers believers. He empowers believers. The, the power of evangelism is solely in the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8. All right. We read it earlier. We're going to read it, read it again. Acts 1.8. He says, but you shall receive power. Right. That's the word dynamos. It means dynamite. All right, so we are going to receive power that after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. From the moment the Holy Spirit indwells you, you have been given the power to witness. Isn't that awesome? The moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit has indwelled you with the power to witness. Therefore, every Christian is expected to witness because every, every Christian has been empowered with the ability to do so. All right, no one is exempt. We have all been empowered with the Holy Ghost to do this. Uh, and so the empowerment comes from the Holy Spirit. Not all of us are called to share the same way, but all of us are called to share. Yeah. And so we are, we're expected to share. There are going to be some people that are extremely bold, extremely bold. And they'll walk up to somebody and straight up ask, are you going to go to heaven or hell when you die? Yeah. I've seen it done. It scares me to death. But that's how some people are. Very bold. That will intimidate you. You would never do that. Some of y'all are very relational. You want to build a relationship with somebody, get to know somebody, and eventually start asking them those kind of questions about Jesus and church and the Bible. That's fine if that's what works with you. But the, here's the thing. The evidence that you have been given the power to share the gospel is that you have a changed life. If you want to know how do I know I have this power, is your life different because of the Holy Spirit? If so, then you've been given the power to witness. Yes. All right, no more excuses. Acts 1.8, your life has been changed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that God gave you in Acts 1.8 is the Holy Spirit he's empowered you with to now tell people about how they can know Jesus. And if you're looking for a tangible electrical power that's going to get you, are going to feel it, it's not that way. It's not that way. See, see, God will use you in ways you're not even aware of. He will empower you in ways you're not even aware of. There's going to be moments... I've walked away from encounters with people, and I thought, well, that was dumb. I messed that up big time. I felt like I just said all the wrong things, all the wrong things. And a day or two later, that person comes up to me and says, you know what? I've been thinking about what you told me. Yeah. And I realized I don't, I don't know Jesus. Can you help me with that? Yeah. And I'm thinking, how in the world did God do that? Because I said all the wrong things. That is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. As long as you're willing, he will use you. In ways you're not even aware. So he empowers the believers, but he also empowers his word. The gospel you share has the power with it to change lives. Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel you share is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God unto salvation is the gospel seed. That's why people can get saved no matter if it's a teenager that shares the gospel, a pastor that shares the gospel, a VBS teacher that shares the gospel, a seminary professor that shares the gospel. It don't matter because the power of that ability to change people is found within the gospel. That's where the power comes from. And so empowered believers sharing an empowered word. I mean, come on. And all you're, all you're commanded to do is just go share it. Just go spread it. It is the gospel that God will use to change hearts and minds. But this doesn't mean that there's some kind of magic wand where you go and tell the gospel to somebody and they'll automatically get saved. I mean, think about it. How many of you heard the gospel multiple times before you got saved? Anybody here hear it multiple times before you got saved? Okay, so we understand that somebody can hear the gospel multiple times and, and, and still not get saved. And so what we, what we have to understand is, is that God must awaken that faith in them to respond to that gospel, to receive it. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is what? The gift of God. And so as you share the gospel, God is giving them the ability to respond to that gospel. It is through the gospel that now unlocks their ability to say yes or no. And, and so you, you, it's not up to you to get the results. All right, now it's between them and God. And, and man, here's a great analogy. I wish I came up with it, but I totally stole it. I stole it from a guy named Donald Whitney in his book. And, and he talks, he says this. 
He says, imagine that sharing the gospel is like walking around in a thunderstorm handing out lightning rods. He says, you don't know when lightning is going to strike or who it's going to strike, but you know when it's going, but you do know when it strikes, you know what it's going to hit. He says, we are just people passing out lightning rods. We don't know who, we don't know when, but we know when it strikes, we know what's it go, what it's going to hit. And so all we have to be is people willing to go out handing out lightning rods. And eventually, one of them is going to strike. Eventually, somebody's going to be like, yes, I want that. And I'm telling you, it will exhilarate you. It will fire you up. It will make you excited. Listen, uh, there, there was a, uh, a professor at the University of Florida. His name was Jerry Ulsman. Jerry Ulsman was a photography professor. And so he was, he was instructing this class of students, and he broke his class into two categories. He told group one, he says, group one, I want you, you're going to be graded on the quantity of the photos you turn in. Group two, you're going to be graded on the quality of the results, uh, photos you turn in. So group one, their assignment was to take as many pictures as possible and to submit them at the end of the year. Group two, they were told to take one picture, pick one excellent picture and turn it in at the end of the year. And the professor was blown away by what he found. At the end of the semester, the best pictures he got were from the people he told to take as many as possible. Now, here's why. Because those students were able to, I mean, they just went crazy, taking all kinds of pictures. And they played around with lighting. And they played around with the editing software. And they played around with the developing. And they played around with all the techniques and all the things, honing out their skills on photography. And, and, and so in, all, in doing all of that, they were able to produce really great photographs. Meanwhile, the other group, who was told to produce one good photograph, they sat around trying to figure out how they can make it perfect trying to figure out how they can get the best results, how they can do it the best. And so at the end of the semester, they turned in one mediocre photograph. And I read this, I read this in a book called Atomic Habits. It's not even a Christian book, but I read it in this book called Atomic Habits. And I read that and immediately thought of evangelism because the most successful people you find in evangelism are the people out there doing it. Meanwhile, the people who are not successful are over there trying to figure out how they can make it good how they can make it perfect, how I can do it. And they're just trying to strategize and try to put the, and meanwhile, the other people are just out there doing it. The key takeaway is this, man, you've been empowered and you've been empowered with the word. You've been empowered with the Holy Spirit. And all you got to do is go out there and do it. All right. The results are not up to you. So just quit waiting and start doing. If you want to grow the muscle of evangelism, guess what? You're going to start putting in reps. All right. You're going to put in reps. And so we, we're not going to grow the muscle of evangelism just sitting around thinking about it, scheming about it, reading about it. You do it. You, you grow it by doing it. And, and so it is the gospel that is the power of God to salvation. It is not your power of persuasion. It's not your, your ability to uh, 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 convince people. No, it's the gospel. And God has given you the power to share it. All right, thirdly, exaltation. Exaltation. It's worship. Another reason why it's important we share in evangelism and share the word is because it is worship. How many of you have ever been to the mall and, 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 and there is in the middle of the mall, there's a kiosk. A lot of times it's around wintertime, but they sometimes have it all year round. Even Bucky's has got it. But I think in the mall it's called the Bavarian Nut. Anybody know what I'm talking about? They make like these candied almonds and pecans. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody been to Bucky's and they have that candy to pecans and almonds and stuff? If you know what I'm talking about, it is, it smells delicious. <laughs> Me and Tracy drove to Georgia this, month, this past Monday and we stopped at Leeds at Bucky's and I walked in, I, I bought gas and was going to go to the bathroom and came out with a bag of cinnamon pecans. <laughs> Why? Because I smelled them and it was irresistible. I was like, I got to have some of them. It's a the smell just made you want to get them. What am I trying to get to? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 14 through 17. It uses the word savor, which is the Greek word osme, which means fragrance. And so I'm going to read this, but I'm going to replace the word savor with fragrance. It says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make it manifest the fragrance of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet fragrance of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish 
To the one we are the fragrance of death unto death, and to the other the fragrance of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? So what is Paul saying? Paul is saying, God has given you a fragrance about your life that is attractive to other people. When you are living for Christ, and your life is a testimony, and your words are the testimony of what God has done for you, it's attractive to people. They want to know what you got. It's a fragrance. Why are you different? Why don't you cuss? Why do you act? Why are you so happy? What's different about you? It's a fragrance. I'll give you a perfect example. There's a fellow in this church that had a, man, a really bad thing happen. His house burned down. And uh, man, it's a tragic, tragic thing. And, and, and then the people of God, his life group and people from the church, man, they came and rallied around him and his wife and just loved on them. And they helped them dig through the rubble and helped them just, just heal during that very, very difficult time in their life. And this, this guy's nephew was sitting there watching all these people show up and just love on him and his, his uncle and his aunt, just loving on them. And, and, and this guy's nephew came to him later and says, hey, I don't have this. Where do you get this? What did they witness? The fragrance of God on the people of God, just living out the gospel. I mean, their lives were the testimony of what God has done for them, right? And so he saw that and he's like, I want some of that. Where'd you get that? So your testimony, the way you live, should be, a, it should be an example of what God has done for you. Part of your worship, part of your worship should be how you share the gospel through your words and your actions. Are you living the fragrance of God? Do you have the fragrance of God on your life? Or when you tell people you go to church, they look like, really? You go to church? No, really, do you have the fragrance of God on your life? Because that's part of your worship. How you live and share the gospel is your worship. All right, so here's, here's the next thing. We need to take away some of our excuses. So we know, we know why it's important, because it's expected, because we've been empowered to do it, and because it's part of our worship. So it's very, evangelism is important. Would we agree? Amen. Okay, fair of you. We on the same page. I hope we agree. It is very, very important. But we got some excuses we got to get rid of. Yeah. One of the excuses is, I don't have enough training. I just wish I had more training. Listen, evangelism in a nutshell should be an overflow from your Christian life anyways. It should just be something you want to tell people about what God has done for you. It's just an overflow of what God has done for you. For months and maybe even years now, Pastor Malcolm, we have been talking about the My Story tracks. Pastor Malcolm's got up here and he's compelled and he's begged us, write your story. Matter of fact, we've made it easy. All you got to do is email it to us. We'll, we'll fix all your grammatical errors because we're country like that, and we have a bunch of them. And we'll fix all your grammatical errors and your spelling errors, and we'll take out the Christianese. Christianese is like when you say things like, I was washed in the blood of the Lamb. If you send that to somebody who's never been to church before, they're going to think you're a maniac, okay? So we take things like that out, and we replace it with words that everybody would understand, and we make it presentable. And then we put it on this computer back here in this back foyer. And all you got to do is type in your name and hit print. And it prints out 20 My Story tracks. That's simple. Yeah. That's simple. And, and we want to use the excuse, I just ain't been trained enough. Listen, there's a story in John chapter 9, verse 25, where Jesus heals a blind man. He didn't have no formal training. He didn't go to a soul winning workshop. He didn't send under, sit under a discipleship program. He had only been saved for a few minutes, and he says, listen, all I know is I was blind, but now I see. Yeah. What did he share? He shared his story. Yeah. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. I think about the Samaritan woman sitting at the well. Mm -hmm. Jesus revealed to her that he was the Messiah, and yeah. she went and told everybody in the city, he says, come see a man which told me all things I ever did. Is this not the Christ? Hey. What did she do? She went, and, she went and told her story. She didn't have soul winning training. Listen, you don't need all the training in the world to be a soul winner. But guess what? We've provided it here at Temple. Yeah. We've had multiple soul winning workshops. I don't know if y'all showed up, <laughs> but we've had them. So if, if training has been an excuse, listen, you don't need formal training. Maybe, maybe your excuse is, you know what? I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. Listen, I know we have a busy life, man. Everybody's going and blowing and just we got family stuff. We got church stuff. We got all kinds of stuff. And, 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 and we got to be very, very, very careful to say we just don't have time. 
Because do you think at the day of judgment when Jesus is before you that he will excuse us from the most single, most important responsibility he gave us because we say, I didn't have time? Out of everything the church does, the only thing in heaven that we, can, we won't be able to do, that we can do here on earth, is evangelism. I love the worship here on Sunday mornings, but I'm telling you the worship in heaven is going to be so much better. I love the fellowship here at Temple Baptist Church, but I'm telling you the fellowship in heaven is going to be so much sweeter. Listen, I, I, love, I love hearing the word preached here at Temple Baptist Church, but I'm telling you when you're in the presence of the living word, I, I, it's going to be so much better. The only thing that we cannot do in heaven that we can do right now is evangelism. And so here, yeah, it's going to be kind of hard to go door to door witness in heaven. You know Jesus? Yeah, he's right over there. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. We have to be intentional about our time. When Jesus told the disciples in, in, in Matthew chapter 20, 18 through, 18 through 20, he says, go you therefore. That phrase literally means as you are going. As you are going. This was not an extra thing that they added on. No, this was something they were doing as they were going. One of my favorite quotes is that we are ordinary people doing ordinary things with gospel intent. We are ordinary people doing ordinary things with gospel intent. I stole that quote from a book called A Meal with Jesus. And that whole book is outlining all the times Jesus ate in the gospels. And, and the reason why is because every time Jesus had a meal, there was also a gospel purpose attached to it. He, listen, Jesus was going to eat already. It wasn't some extra he was doing. He was already going to sit down and eat. But he would take that time and use it for a gospel purpose. He would sit down with sinners and tax collectors. He would sit down with Pharisees. He would sit down with his disciples. And every time he ate, he would talk about the gospel. Listen, it's an ordinary thing. Listen, you might be saying, I'm so busy. Well, that's great. Hey, that's awesome. Because while you're busy, you could be sharing the gospel. When you pump the gas at the gas station, you could share the gospel. When you go get your food, you could share the gospel. When you go to the bank, you could share the gospel. When you go to your kids' ball games, you can share the gospel. Listen, while you're at work, share the gospel. At the doctor's appointment, guess what you can do? Share the gospel. So as you are going, that is the lifestyle we live. We are ordinary people doing ordinary things with gospel intent. We're just passing out lightning rods everywhere we go. Because eventually one of them is going to strike. And so we just pass out lightning rods, hoping one day somebody will respond to that gospel. And so as we were going, let me give you a perfect example of that. My dad, my dad, um, he used to do a thing called Real One In. It was a, he had a boat, loved to offshore fish all the time. And, and so this is him on his boat taking some, some guys out, and you see the big Jesus fish on the side there. Um, and his, his whole thing was he liked to take people out on the boat and, and, and to share the gospel with them. Now, my dad was already going to go fishing on Saturday, whether anybody went with him or not. He already had the gas. He already had the bait. He already had the equipment. He's going fishing. But he would stop. He would launch the boat at the dock and see people fishing off the dock. He would say, hey, y'all want to go fishing? Now, I don't know if you've ever paid for an offshore fishing trip, but it's expensive. And here's my dad offering an offshore fishing trip for free. Why? Because he was already going to go. And so he would take complete strangers on the boat with him, fishing five miles offshore. He said they couldn't get away from me. <laughs> and while he's on the boat fishing, guess what he would do? Share the gospel. Why? He was somebody ordinary doing something ordinary with a gospel intent. I mean, we, don't, we, we complicate the gospel. We make it so difficult. And all we got to do is just be ordinary people doing ordinary things. And so we have to discipline ourselves to share the gospel. Because I think really what it comes down to is a lack of discipline. We got to discipline ourselves to be around lost people. I'm in ministry. I'm a paid staff member at a church. All my friends and my coworkers, I think, are saved. All the people I interact with on a regular basis are saved. My family is saved. Everybody I know is saved. And so it's really easy for me to use the excuse, well, everybody I know is saved. <laughs> and so I have to discipline myself to put myself around lost people. And so I go to the gym. I know you can't tell, but I go to the gym. <laughs> and guess what I find at the, at, the, at the gym? Lost people. I have had so many gospel conversations sitting in a sauna. I mean, it's just shirtless men sitting there. Might as well make it more awkward. And so I'll just start talking to them. 
and share the gospel. I've had so many conversations. Listen, I, I, I talked to so many people. Listen, I'm going to go out to eat. Guess what I'm going to do to the waitress? I'm going to share the gospel. Matter of fact, I want to introduce you to Jamie. This is Jamie. She, she works at Logan's right up the road. Me and Tracy went up there and ate not long ago. And she came to our table and said, Jamie, is there anything we can pray for you about? And she got real emotional. She says, yeah, pray for my boyfriend. He's going through a hard time. Can you just pray for him? I said, absolutely. And she stood right at the table and prayed with us. She walked off. She said, let me go check on your food. She came back and said, Jamie, I appreciate you being so honest with us and vulnerable. I said, can I ask you a personal question? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? She said, well, when I was little, I went to my grandpa's church. I said, okay. I said, well, let me ask you, Jamie. If you was to take your last breath on this earth and step into eternity, would you go to heaven? She said, no. I said, Jamie, does that concern you? She said, yeah. I said, what's stopping you from believing in Jesus today? She says, nothing. And she scooted into that booth right next to me, and she prayed to receive Jesus Christ as her Savior. They're at Logan's right up the road. Now, I, I share that because I was going to eat anyways. Might as well share the gospel while I'm doing it. Listen, you're going to go to the ball game anyways. Share the gospel. Don't make it something extra. And, and so we have made it so complicated, and, and we just need to discipline ourselves to evangelism. Now, now here's what I want to do. Uh, I want to invite Pastor Malcolm up here because because we want to kind of give you some technique, some technique. Oh, uh, maybe because some of you are like, maybe I don't know how to get the conversation started. Now, this was my problem. I always felt really nervous because I'd be sitting there trying to figure out, okay, what do I say? What do I, how do I how do I start it? How do I start it? And then God helped me with this. He said, "Man, just have a conversation. <laughs> Quit trying to make it gospel right off the bat. Just." Talk to him. Hey, what is your name? My name is Andrew. It is nice to meet you. And you just have a, ca a casual conversation. Just start talking to people. And as you start talking to people, you start listening. All of a sudden, you start finding ways you can weave in a gospel conversation. But we got to quit thinking, overthinking things and just share the gospel. So, Pastor Malcolm, I know we talked about a little bit earlier uh, about, about the SHARE an uh, acronym. So, you right. want to talk about that? I, one thing about uh, the one he just introduced, I was there the week after that took place, and uh, and she came. I, I didn't know it. He had told the testimony of it happening, and uh, I went in there to get lunch, and and I shared with her. I said, I said, ma'am, is there anything I can pray for you about? She said, Are you the preacher at Temple? <laughs> I said, Maybe. <laughs> and she said, She said, Somebody from your church right over there led me to Jesus. And, it, and then I said, that's the one. That's the one. So that's a, that's a, that's a really cool story. Now, here, here's what we want to do. We want to make it real simple, right? Write this down somewhere. Find a blank space on there somewhere and write these three things down. This is, this is going to be our strategy, if you want to use that term. Uh, their story, their story, my story, God's story. Okay, their story, my story, and God's story. That's going to be our strategy. We want to, we want to invest ourselves into their story. How do we get their story? How do we get their story? On your paper, you see the, the, the acrostic share, S-H-A-R-E. Say that with me. S-H-A-R-E. S. Everybody, S. Secular. H. A. R, E, okay, here's some questions. Here's some questions. Do we have the questions on there? No. Okay, here's, here's the questions. S, secular. Here's what we do. Uh, I've met, I've met uh, Brother Andrew. We're, we're at uh, Dick's Sporting Goods. We're in the putting green section. He comes up. We're just having a conversation. And we start with S. Hey, man, my name's Malcolm. What's your name? Uh, Andrew. Andrew, good to meet you, Andrew. You from here? Uh, moved here about seven years ago. Is that right? Yeah. Is that yeah. right? Well, how, what, what brought you to Coleman? Uh, job. Job. Moved my family from Panama City to here. Family? You got family? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, wife and uh, two kids. What letter are we on? H. H. We moved from secular, just chit-chat, folksy, all right, to H, home. You got any kids? Yeah, two kids. Um, 
I got a 10 year old little boy and oh, boy. a 13 year old girl. A boy and a girl. Yeah. Well, I've got four girls. Oh Lord. You see all this gray here? Yeah. Wow. That's what that's from. Wow. My goodness. What about, you got any other family here in Coleman? Uh, yeah, I got, I got an aunt and uncle and a couple cousins and my grandmother and uh, other than that, just me and my family. Well, cool, man. Well, let me ask you a question. Yeah. How's, how's things going? How's life treating you? Uh, you know, things are tough. Uh, you know, the economy is not the best, so. Having a know, tough time. Having to work a lot. That's A. Attitude. Here's, this is what we're doing, guys. This is what we're doing. We are building a bridge. We are building a bridge from our heart to their heart that Jesus can walk across. But did you notice we started with secular? We didn't just bust in and say, if you're die right now, you're 100% sure you'd go to heaven, would there be some doubt? Uh, you're crazy, man. All right. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. But we're going we're gonna to build a bridge first. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not against anybody that uses any method that would, I'd, I'd rather you do it than not do it. Yeah. Okay? People, people say, well, I don't like the way you do it. I say, I don't like the way you don't do it. <laughs> so if you're doing it, I'm not criticizing that. I'm just saying there might be a little better way. Sure. Does that make sense? So, so, uh, uh, so it's just been tough, huh? The economy's been rough on you? Yeah, a lot of working, uh, but... We're trying to make it. Okay. Make it. Well, man, let me ask you a question. You get to go to church anywhere? Uh, well, I work a lot, so it makes it kind of tough. Um, you know, weekends are, a lot of times, that's the time I get to spend with my family, so I haven't been in a long time. Okay. What letter? R. R. Religion. And don't say, you go to church. That's way different than, hey, do you get to go to church anywhere? Don't ever, don't ever speak as if it's sounding like you're speaking down to somebody or you're sounding judgmental. I'm saying, do you get to go to church anywhere? He says he's, he works a lot. Well, we're at E. Now when we get, here is the transition. Hey man, you got just a minute. I, can I want to share my story with you. You got just a minute? Yeah, yeah. All right, now we go into the one minute story. Here's my one minute story. You know, Andrew, there was a time in my life I was very religious. I, I, my, my father was a pastor. I, I grew up in church my whole life, man. It's all I've ever known. Went to Christian school, the whole deal. And, man, I, I had to memorize tons of Bible when I was a kid. And, and you know, you could say I, I pretty much knew a lot about God. But, man, something was wrong. Something felt missing, you know. And I, I would think about dying, and it would scare me to death. I had anxiety and and then one day, somebody shared a message with me that changed my life. They said, Malcolm, it's not enough to know about God. You needed to know God. Yes. And man, that was me. I knew all about God. But I didn't have that personal relationship. And I, that day, I said, Jesus, will you please forgive me? Please forgive me and save me. I want to know you. I don't want to just know about you. And boy, from that day on, God took all of the fear away man, I feel fulfilled, complete, and I have a peace that I can't even explain. And I'm telling you, I want everybody to have that peace. And all that's because of what Jesus did for me. Andrew, I want to ask you a question. Do, do you have a story like that? Um, no, not really. No. You see what happened? I got his story first through the share, S-H-A-R-E. I talked about him. I learned about him. I showed him I cared. People do not care how much you know till they. All right. And then said, let me tell you my story. Let me tell you my story. And remember this. Everybody's story is powerful. Everybody's story is powerful. I could bring my dad up here and he could tell you things that would curl your hair. I'm talking about a story of how God changed just a bad, bad person to somebody who loved people, all right? Now, mine and his story's completely opposite. Completely opposite. He wasn't raised in church. I was. He, was he, he had a rough upbringing. I didn't. Everything's different, but guess what? My story is my story. Yeah. His story is his story. And our story is powerful in the sense, not that it has the power to save, but it has the power to make one thirsty to hear this story. Let me tell you something. 
God made us all to be with him. We're going down G-O-S-P-E-L. It should be in your handout. Then. Yes, it should be right in your handout. God made us, Andrew, God made us to be with him. But you know, our sins have separated us from God. Romans chapter 3 says that we're all sinners and come short of the glory of God, you know. And, and sin could never be, never be taken away or removed by good deeds. But Jesus paying the price for sin, he died and rose again. And everyone that puts their trust in Jesus alone will be saved. And life begins with Jesus today and lasts forever. And, and, and see, we are going into God's story. Now, because of time, you can plug in Romans. Write these down. Write these down. Romans 3.23. Romans 6.23. Romans 5, 8, and Romans 10, 9, and 10. And we can plug them in. Romans 3, 23, for the wages, or excuse me, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and, can, and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so we plug that into the G-O-S-P-E-L. Does everybody see that? Now watch. Have y'all noticed anything? Y'all noticed anything? How many notes am I reading? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I memorized it. Three things. Write these three things down. It's always three, isn't it? It's always three. Memorization. Presentation. Conversation. Say, I want to get good at this. Memorize it. Yeah. Memorize it. And it don't take long. You read it. So, some of y'all think that, boy, he's just good at memorizing verses. No, I don't. I read it like 500 times during that week, so it gets stuck in there. But memorize. Memorize it. All right? Get it. Talk it over and over and over and over and over again. Memorization, presentation. That just means to practice. Practice over and over again. These guys, these guys have been practicing. And, and let me say this about, I, I, totally, I, I totally agree with the embrace the awkward stuff. But I will tell you this. The more you do it, the less awkward it will be. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and it, will turn, it will turn into conversation. Two of the best soul winners I've ever met in my life is Dr. David Nelms and Dave Gibson. Dave Gibson is the one to come up with the, the My Story track. And, and I've sat under their teaching, I've sat under their training, took all the notes like a madman, you know, couldn't just, just. But when I sat there and watched them in a restaurant, sharing their faith, we were just sitting there talking about, I don't even remember what we were talking about, the, the ball game or something, or just fishing or something. And, and we were just having this conversation, just having a big time. And, and, and the waiter, we was in, in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and, and the waiter come up, and Brother Nels just turned to him and just began talking to him. And just said, hey, man, I, I'm, a, I'm a, 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 a traveling preacher, and I, I go around the country, and, and I, just, I just share Jesus with everybody I can. And, and I was just interested to know if, if you knew the Lord. And, and, and goes in this, just didn't even break stride. It didn't even sound any different. It wasn't choppy. It wasn't, uh, 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 uh. He made it part of the, and it was smooth as silk. But do you know why he could do that? He done it. He's done it about five bazillion times. <laughs> so this is not, this, <clears throat> I don't want to get too much on this because I'm going to preach some more on this Sunday. But we will never share our faith on accident. Yeah, yeah. So if you're trying to decide right now if you're going to do it, you're not going to do it. But if you take, 
You know, now how many of y'all know that the Bible says thou shalt not steal? Oh, yeah. And we won't. Bless God. That's a, that's a sin. I ain't going to do that. Thou shalt commit adultery. You would never dream of committing adultery. That's a terrible sin. Then why do we not believe disobeying a direct command from God for us to tell people what Jesus has done for us is any less sin than them? It's a command. Mm -hmm. All right, now. Now. Uh, Jesus is going to be with you every step of the way. Oh, yeah. All right? Uh, and you're going you're gonna to get it messed up. Most of y'all have heard my, my story with my grandmother. When I, when I was preaching and she got saved, I did everything wrong, said everything wrong. I didn't do anything right, and she got saved. All right. She never missed another service after that. She's in heaven tonight because I did everything wrong. You know what that teaches us? Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It's up to God. Now, let me ask you a question. And we're running out of time, but let me ask you a question. How many of you, when you think about, oh my goodness, if I try to share my faith, what if they ask me a question I don't know? How many of y'all, come on, raise your hand. I don't see it. What if they ask me a question? I don't know. Let's solve it right here. here here's what we do. Y'all ready? Here's what we do. Give you the answer right here. That's a good question. Let me hear. That's a good question. Like you're really interested. You ready? That's a good question. I don't know. Isn't that, isn't that liberating? <laughs> you don't have to know every answer to every question. That's a good question. Let, let, me, let, let me show you. <clears throat> Ask me where, where Cain got his wife. Well, where did Cain get his wife? You know what? That is a good question. And I have no idea. But you know what? I'll tell you what. I'm going to talk to my preacher. And I'm going to find out. And I'll let you know. I'll let you know. But back to what we were talking about. <laughs> right? Yeah. Let's try it. You ready? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. And I'll find, I'll find out. I'll find out. And all God's people see it. Amen. All right. We've got one minute and 47 seconds. Now, this is a little different. It's a little different how we normally do things. But does anybody got a question about sharing your faith? Anybody got a question about sharing your faith? Out there at Fairview? <laughs> yeah, Fairview. How about it? Got any questions out there? That's funny, isn't it? <laughs> yes, sir. Brother, Brother Mark. Oh, yes, follow up. If, if, if Brother Andrew, if I pray with Brother Andrew and he trusts Christ as a Savior, first thing I'm going to tell you, dude, man, I want you, I'm going to talk to him about baptism. Now, if you're not comfortable with that yet, if you're just getting this, hey, I'm proud for you. But we'll say, hey, I would love for my preacher to be able to talk to you or one of our staff members or, man, would you come and be with us this week? Sit with me in church this week. All right. And we will teach you these things. We will teach you these things. We, we do this in the training, in the Share Your Faith workshop. That, Like he said, we've done twice. Some of y'all weren't here. That's why we're doing it tonight. See, man. <laughs> so we want, you to, we want you to be good at that. But let me, let, me, let me say this. Let me say this. Preacher, I just cannot see myself doing that. Will you at least, will you at least at the bare minimum invite somebody to church? Yeah. It's easy. Now, we are commanded to do more than that, but will you at least, at the bare minimum, say, hey, I would love for you to go to church with me this Sunday. Amen. Or I'm going to be, I'll wait right out at the front. And, 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 and Andrew, uh, man, if you, you come, you can sit with me and my family, and, uh, and you can meet all four of them girls that gave me gray hair. Huh. <laughs> Listen, people are hungry. They're starving to death for somebody to care. I told you, I told you, the, the gentleman at Marco's Pizza, I pulled up to the thing and he opens the window, doesn't even look at me. And I said, hey man, I said, I said, my name's Malcolm, what's your name? And he just looks at me like I was from space. And this is what he says. He says, well, this is a refreshing breath of humanity. <laughs> 
That's exactly what I did. I said, what? I said, what do you mean? He said, most people will not even speak to me. He said, they will just hand their money through the window and not even look at me. Yeah. And he was just so thrilled that somebody said, what's your name? Listen, let's practice this. Smile. Let me see you smile. Come on. There we go. Let's see him. Let's see him. All right. That right there will give you an invitation to share your story with someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed they done quit smiling out there? No, I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm serious. Pass somebody in Walmart. Anywhere. The grocery store. They're starving. Let's go tell them.